If you're a founder, you know that fundraising is a big part of the job. What you might not know is that Carta is there to help. Carta's new fundraising suite provides startups of all stages the best tools and support to easily issue safes, accurately forecast dilution, and quickly close funding rounds. Save time, money, and make your next round your best yet. To learn more or to get started, go to carta.com forward slash fundraise. That's carta.com forward slash fundraise. Welcome to Inks for Starters with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, a serial entrepreneur myself and founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm that backs fearless founders who are solving some of the biggest challenges facing humanity. Now in our sixth season, we sit down each week with one of the best founders on the planet to hear their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Let's dive right in. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alex Von Tobel, and this week I'm excited for you to meet Daniel Chait, the founder and CEO of Greenhouse, the leader in hiring software. Daniel started Greenhouse in 2012 on a mission to help every company become great at hiring. As a technology entrepreneur for over 22 years, Daniel's firsthand experience leading people in recruitment showed him the value that a modern hiring platform could bring to businesses. In 2021, TPG acquired the majority of the company in a $500 million deal. Prior to Greenhouse, Daniel co-founded Lab49, a global firm providing technology consulting solutions for the world's leading investment banks. Daniel holds a degree in computer engineering from the University of Michigan, and as someone who has now done almost 250 plus of these episodes, hiring matters so much. So I want to welcome Daniel. First of all, Daniel, I'm so thrilled to have you on. Everything you built at Greenhouse, I feel like I watched as a fellow entrepreneur. I want to start with just the basics. What is Greenhouse in your own words, and where did the aha moment come from back in 2012? Yeah, thanks. Great to be here, Alexa. So Greenhouse is a hiring software company. Our mission is to make every company in the world great at hiring. And we do that with a set of software tools that companies use to run all aspects of the hiring process, from where do they find candidates and connecting to places like LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter, all the way through interviewing and selecting candidates and onto offering and even bringing them on board. Greenhouse does all of it for everyone in the organization, whether you're a hiring manager or a recruiter. And I think that was really the aha moment, because before Greenhouse, most software that dealt with hiring was really about what the recruiting team needed to track. So you have this little group in your company who has to handle all the resumes and all the paperwork and keep track of compliance. And they had these little software tools called applicant tracking systems, yep. which was just about the paperwork and the notes. And we thought hiring was a much bigger problem for companies. And the solution was a much bigger opportunity to help companies solve this really strategic challenge of getting great at hiring. Let's talk a little bit about your go-to-market and your playbook. How did you scale up market with big customers like Airbnb? Kind of walk us through those early days, 2012, all the way to today. Yeah. So look, in the early days, you know, we followed kind of the lean product, lean startup methodology where, you know, at the beginning, it was less about finding growth and more about how quickly can you learn and how fast can you iterate. And actually growth harms that. And so we really wanted to understand like, hey, we have this idea. Hiring is really important to companies, and most companies think they stink at it. Is that idea right? Do most companies agree with that? And then we have the second idea. We think here's a solution to that problem. We think companies should act more like this. They should use structured hiring. They should develop interview plans. They should source candidates from a wide range of places, not just from one or two, et cetera. Are we right? Do they agree? Well, like, how hard is it to get them to buy into those concepts? And then we can talk about software, like, who buys this product? How much are they used to paying for it? What if we wanted to charge more or differently? And so we took each of those questions over that first kind of year or two and just broke them down into specific phases that we wanted to understand. What are we trying to learn here? How quickly can we learn it? And then once we've learned it, what do we move on to the next step? And so we were very intentional about that. We didn't get ahead of ourselves. I give 100% of the credit for that way of working to my co-founder, John, who's much more patient and thoughtful than I am. I was ready to just go straight at it. But having done that, I think it was an incredibly smart way to do it because as we moved from question to question, we started building up this really strong conviction that we were on the right track, that we had answered the questions we'd answered very definitively. And so we knew, hey, this is a big problem for companies. I can't tell you, Alexa, how many founders or CEOs or executives I spoke to who said exactly what you just said. Hiring is one of the most important things in my company. It's also the thing that we struggle with the most over and over again. Then when we started talking about our solution, not software, just like 
how should the company act differently to solve that important problem? We started sharing what our idea was. Actually, the very first revenue into Greenhouse, fun trivia question, we charged for a training class. I went to General Assembly and we said, hey, we want to teach all these great things about being a startup from how to build a website and do digital marketing to how to program. We want to teach how to hire. They said, that seems like a great idea. So they would bring the students, they supplied the facility, and all we had to do is show up and do the curriculum. The curriculum was really our product brief, right? In secret. We said, hey, here's how you make your company great at hiring. You do this, you do that, you do the other thing. You make an interview plan, you assign specific questions to specific individuals, you collect data in a certain way, and we listened. And if we thought, hey, if that idea resonates, we got something. And if everybody looks at us like we're aliens, then we have to go back to the drawing board. And so hearing the positive feedback out of those early classes that, by the way, we were getting paid to teach was incredibly valuable feedback for us and let us know that we are on the right track. So that's the early days. And we can talk about scaling, but hopefully that gives you a sense of like where we were when we started and how we got off the ground. That gives us a great insight into getting off the ground. You spent over a decade thinking about hiring practices. I would be remiss not to ask you, what advice do you have for companies trying to make better hiring decisions? What have you learned? Give us your advice. School us. Yep. So as much as I would love to say that the answer is buy greenhouse and everything is magically better, the truth of the matter is we've studied this. We have interviewed hundreds of executives. We've looked at the data from thousands of companies. And the answer is very clear. The difference between what makes a company great at hiring and every other company comes down to leadership behavior. Simply put, if leaders themselves are personally involved in hiring, if they set a culture of hiring where it's seen as something important, worthy of attention and focus, where talented people should spend time, if they talk about hiring at all hands, if they give data and metrics about them and things like OKRs and KPI uh, decks, like that sets the bar for hiring is important at this place. Everything follows from there. Conversely, if they don't, if they wash their hands and they say, hey, look, my job as the executive is to sell or to make the product and like, hey, HR, go find us the right people, fail. HR cannot just, quote, go find you the right people. They don't have secret access to the A players that they can just like serve up on a silver platter. It's not how it works. And so if I have one advice more than anything, I wrote about this in, in the book that John and I wrote called Talent Makers, where we gave that role that leaders play a name. And if you can act as a talent maker, then the world is your oyster and you can compete for talent. I love that. I want to talk a little bit about how, because of platforms like Greenhouse, making hiring decisions become more fair has been core to your product development. What are some of the ways where you've embedded fairness and equality into the platform, which obviously is incredibly important and will only get more important in the future? Yeah. So look, these are the kind of things, they get very politicized very quickly because people love to shout at each other about whether you're too woke or whatever. I think at the end of the day, what we've always said is great hiring is about finding the absolute best person you can and getting them to join your organization. And so much of what happens in human interaction, forget hiring, just the way our brains are wired is we make mistakes. We overlook certain information and we consider other information too strongly. We misinterpret what people say or, or who they are, what they can do. And so I think the best hiring is about, number one, making sure that you're actually interviewing the best people, not just the best people who apply. And so it's getting out there and finding who those people are, wherever they are, whether they went to your favorite college, whether they've worked at a cool company that you've heard of or not. And number two, is doing a really smart job of assessing those candidates, making sure that you're finding the best person for the job not just the best person at interviewing. And those are two very different skills. And so with that context as background, what I would say is Greenhouse, by putting in place a structured hiring approach, has done the most fundamental work that there is around fair hiring, which is also the most fundamental work that there is around good hiring in general. I'll give you one concrete example about that. One of the things that Greenhouse does for our customers is in our software, you can manage the process that many interviewing teams do of sending some take-home test or some take-home problem for your candidates to work on and submitting it back to you. A lot of programming teams do this. They ask you to do some coding exercise. Maybe a marketing team will do it and have you write a pitch, et cetera. And in Greenhouse, you can grade those questions anonymously. You can send the work out and get the work back from the candidate. You don't know who the candidate was. You just grade the work. And our data proves that when you do that anonymously, you actually collect about 10% more 
submissions from black applicants than if you had not done it anonymously because they just know that they'll be treated more fairly. And the pass-through rates of black applicants versus white applicants is equal if the test is graded anonymously and is not equal if the test is graded with the name attached to it. Black applicants pass those tests about 10% lower rate if their name is attached to it, which is a very sad commentary on humanity and society, but is very promising when you realize the solution to it is right in front of us. It's very easy. It's cost-free and actually gives you access to better talent that your competitors are probably overlooking. So in this case, it's a great opportunity to both do right, to be more fair, to be more in line with your values and doing well for people, and to give yourself an edge for great talent that other organizations may be missing. I love that so much, Daniel. A few thoughts that we would love to dig into here. You've raised over $100 million in venture capital before selling the majority stake to a private equity firm, TPG. Yeah. In this market, we expect a lot more outcomes to look like private equity outcomes as huge companies are having more trouble these days acquiring businesses. Can you talk a little bit about how you thought through that decision as a founder? What did the financing moment mean to you personally? And just teach us what we could learn being in a position to sell a majority stake? Yeah, two different questions. I think firstly, you know, sort of how did we think about it? The way I've always thought of it, which isn't how everyone does, but for me, I think about the long-term mission of the business. In our case, we have this wildly ambitious mission to help every company in the world become great at hiring. To be clear, we've helped about 7,000 companies in the world be like a little bit better at some parts of hiring so far. I feel very proud of that. There's a long way to go. And so with that mission in mind, these financing things to me are just a tool to get there. And I know that a lot of founders start a business with a hope that I want to raise venture capital. I want to be valued at $100 million. I want to go public. Whatever these things are, that's not what motivates me. It's not how I think about it. And so to me, it's more of an instrumental question of what's the right financing tool for the company at a given stage and so forth. And so that's not the only way or the best way to think about it. It's just how I think about it. As far as why we chose to do and, and sort of what there is to know about that, that's probably its own, you know, MBA. What I would say is maybe one of my top learnings is under a private equity majority owner ownership structure, you have a whole different relationship to that stakeholder than you did as a venture capital backed company. In VC, roughly speaking, and with a lot of caveats, it's a hits driven business. And so at the moment where they invest in you, they're thinking, can this be you know, a 10x or 100x outcome? And if they think that's a good chance of happening, they'll put in their ticket, spin the wheel, and sort of see what happens. I'm, um, again, a little bit stereotyping. Whereas in venture capital, they're in the business of putting money in and reliably getting out three to five x, more or less every time. And so they're very good at investing in companies where they already have a big belief that can happen. They're very good at helping it become more likely to happen. And then they're very good at actually helping make it happen. And so you got to be aware in both of those cases, is this what you want? Is this what's good for your business? Because every business isn't right for venture capital any more than every business is right for private equity. But if you feel like, yeah, that's in line with where we're trying to go as a business or where you're trying to go as a company, just recognize private equity doesn't get rich just buying shares in your company. They got to sell them at some point. They want to sell them when they're higher than when they bought them. So what is the, they call a value creation plan. How are they going to, make the business or help the business get more valuable in three to five years than it was when they came in? And how's that all going to go? And if you're in line with them on that, then it can be a really great journey for us. It's been outstanding. Sometimes it can go further than that. And you find yourself in a really difficult spot where they're trying to do one thing to create value. They have the power to make you do that. And it's not what you want to do or it's not what you think is good. That can be really stressful. I agree with everything that you just said. Last question before we transition a little bit more to you, Daniel. The world is changing. We have AI agents coming in. We have agentic AI that could replace jobs. When you think about the future of hiring, what do you see? It's a really interesting moment right now. I mean, you talk about AI and it's impacting everyone's work in so many different ways. You know, one of the lesser understood ways that it's impacting hiring that I think we have a unique view on is there's almost this AI arms race now happening between job applicants and employers. For a long time through technology, it's gotten easier and easier to apply for a job. When I graduated college, I put pieces of paper that I printed out at Kinko's into envelopes and licked them. 
doesn't happen anymore. So it's making it easier and easier. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine who was applying for a job. He's using AI tools to customize his application to each job, write a personalized cover letter to that company, and automatically apply to dozens and dozens of jobs without having to do anything. So the volume of job applications is going up and up and up, aided by technology and AI. And then on the company side, they're being overwhelmed with job applicants. They open up a role. We have customers that open up a job and they call flash the job instead of open the job. They open it, they leave the job post on their website for 12 or 24 hours, and they take it down because they have 500 applicants already. It's too many to get through. And so they want to use AI to trim that list back down. <laughs> applicants are using AI to expand the candidate pool, and then companies are trying to use AI to shrink it back down. Like It's only getting worse. Where does it end? And so we're thinking really hard about what's the way out of that dilemma? How do you just like change the dynamic completely? And it's not this never-ending arms race where eventually everyone's going to open up a job and get all 7 billion earthlings into the funnel immediately <laughs> and then just give all decision-making authority over to a magical computer you can't understand to pick the right person for you with no effort and hand it to you. Like All of that is dystopian and horrible and we're trying to fix it. It's funny, I just opened up a job and we got almost 500 applicants. Yeah, And so I totally know exactly what you mean. We were just struggling with that here at Inspired, which was wonderful. And at the same time, how do you give everybody a good experience if you're just truly deluged? And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Alexa here. Not only do I get the opportunity to speak with all types of founders on the Inc. Founders Project podcast, I'm also a founder myself. I believe that when the world zigs, you have to zag. So in 2008, when the entire world was in free fall during the global financial crisis, I decided to drop out of business school to solve a problem I couldn't get out of my head. LearnVest was born, and I set out on my fundraising journey to build the first digital financial manager accessible to the masses. I can't stress enough how vital fundraising is to a startup and how many no's I had to endure. Carta knows this and had founders in mind when they created their fundraising suite, providing tools and support to take the friction out of fundraising and saving founders time and money, allowing founders to focus on their goals, not the admin work needed to close around. From simply issuing safes to quickly receiving funds, Carter's Fundraising Suite helps their cap table customers raise a better fundraising round. To learn more or to get started, go to carta.com forward slash fundraise. That's carta.com forward slash fundraise. Let's talk a little bit about you, Daniel. I always like to go back to you growing up as somebody who's now been for sure a massively successful entrepreneur with a huge outcome. I always like to go back to your household. And I knew you grew up in an entrepreneurial household. And so I always like to ask, is there something specific that your parents did that you almost feel like was a straight line to your personal success as an entrepreneur, as a grown up? You know, it's funny. My mom started a business at our kitchen. So she was a teacher and she re retired from teaching to have my brother and me and, and to raise us. But when, when I was quite young, seven or eight, she started a business at our kitchen table. And so I watched that happen from the very early days. And by the time I was in high school, she had a, an office and a bunch of employees and a growing business. And I worked there. And a lot of my friends and I worked at my mom's company. That was like our, our version of a high school job, you know, making hamburgers was I wouldn't wash the coffee pots in my mom's office. But you can draw a straight line from that moment to what I'm doing now. Because I was also, I know this will be surprising to hear, I was somewhat of a computer nerd growing up. And so I logged a lot of hours on my Apple II and then later on IBM PC putzing around and learning word perfect macros and learning how to program and, and doing things like that. And so I got into this office situation. I just started figuring out how to solve the problems that were happening around the office using the computer. And there was this moment where it was a very laborious job that people at the office were doing, compiling these documents for clients. And I thought, hey, wait a second, we can make a macro for that. And so I watched what they did. I made a little macro and I saved dozens of hours a week for people that were doing this uh, work. And I was probably 15 or 16 years old at the time. And the magical feeling that just by having an idea and sitting by myself in front of this machine, I could make someone else's life so much better. I could make someone's business so much more efficient. Like I was immediately hooked. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I was quite a weird kid for wanting to like solve business problems with technology since I was a teenager. But it's literally what I wanted to do. It's amazing. And it's very much exactly where you ended up. One of the things that you said was that as a lifelong entrepreneur, Greenhouse is now the largest company you've ever been part of. How have you learned to scale yourself, Daniel? And that's one of the hardest jobs as an entrepreneur. And I think 
here at Inspired, we always look for entrepreneurs that we say we have a feeling that they will 10x themselves every single year. They will just be getting better at scaling themselves. How have you done it? Yeah, you have to. And just to correct the record, I worked for nine months. I was an entry-level programmer at a 12,000-person company. I don't know that that gave me a lot of a, a leadership training, but but I did technically work at a huge company once. Yeah, look, I mean, for me, bringing as much humility as I can, like I really need to understand my limitations of experience and trying to hire people who've been there, done that, who have some pattern matching, and have some intuition about problems I've never seen before has been a big part of it. A ton of active listening. They're really trying to get inside people's heads when people say things. Part of the benefit and drawback of, of having such an odd career path where I've really never had a boss, I've never been part of a company that wasn't my own for you know, 30 years almost, is I don't know why people do the things they do that seem obvious to them. So I ask a lot of questions like, why do we do a staff meeting that way? Why is this that way? And, and so I often find myself learning just through interrogating some basic questions and trying to do a lot of active listening. And then lastly, the serenity prayer, right? You got to know what you can change. You got to have, you know, the wisdom to, to tell the difference between that and the things you can't. I love that. Stress is a big part of being a founder CEO. And I'm always curious on how founders learn to manage it, because I think you can't manage others until you can manage yourself. Talk a little bit about how you do that and how you've gotten better at managing stress. I don't really manage stress all that well, but I also don't experience a ton of it. And when I do, it just kind of overwhelms me. So in general, I don't get that stressed. I'm pretty even keeled. And sort of my life saying is this too shall pass, works in good times, works in bad times. And so I just kind of take things as they come. And there are things that are stressful, particularly for me, like if I have to have a really difficult conversation with an employee, if I have to let someone go, I'll often just not sleep for three or four days. It's really bad. I haven't figured out how to handle that. But a lot of the things I think keep normal people up at night, I don't worry about and I sleep really well. It's funny. I find that either you're extremely good at managing stress or you don't have a lot of it. Yeah, I don't think I have a lot of it. Which is what I have observed doing a lot of these interviews. Um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about, you're an avid canoeist. Absolutely. Tell us more. Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up in the Midwest. I went to camp uh, every summer in northern Wisconsin, about 90 miles outside of Duluth, Minnesota, and uh, went to the Boundary Waters, which is uh, about a million acres of unspoiled wilderness on the Canadian border in northern Minnesota. And so as a young boy, the opportunity to get out there and Again, try things that you hadn't tried before and, you know, scrape your knees or, you know, be in a little bit of a difficult physical circumstance and get through it and be okay. And by the way, do it as part of a team because you're not going out on your own. You're going out there with six or seven other kids and you're responsible for what happens, just you and your skills and your attitude. And I learned so many life lessons doing that, whether it's having a positive attitude when a bear eats your food or it rains for four days in a row or your sleeping bag gets wet or the hike is longer than you thought. Like the difference between those experiences being miserable or being uplifting is all about what happens between your ears. It's your attitude. It's not the circumstance. And so we had a saying like, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad preparation. And so I, I don't know. I, I spent a lot of time in the outdoors as a kid. And it was one of those moments where I just felt like this is where you're at most in your own head and with your own self is when everything else is stripped away all the complexity of modern society, none of the beeps and bloops of our devices are there. It's just you and a boat and trees and some birds, and you can just breathe and you can think. So I'm never happier than when I wake up in the morning in a tent looking at the sky. You just nailed something for me, which is there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad preparation. And everything that matters is between your ears. It's a pretty good life motto. I always say we have to start the day with positive attitudes and gratitudes, but that's even better. And I love it, Daniel. You're a pretty soulful founder and very much there is a clear depth to how you think about the world. In building your business, what do you hold as sacred? To me, it's trust and honesty. I'm a relationship-oriented person. And so Fred Kaufman said in any conversation, there's three realities. There's what's in your head, there's what's in my head, and there's what's between us. And we only both have access to that third thing. I don't know what's in your head. You don't know what's in my head. But if we focus on what's between us, we can tackle anything. If we don't, if I'm only thinking about what I'm thinking about, then we're, we're on separate pages. We're hopeless. So I'm always thinking about if there's a team issue, if there's a trust issue, everything else falls to the wayside. Let's fix that trust issue and then move forward together. I love it. And I very much agree. 
I'm going to move to the quick fire round. Just the first thing that comes to your mind will get you out of bed every day. Solving the world's most impactful hiring problems with a remarkable team. What really gets me out of bed in the morning is my French press. Amen. What is an interview question that you like to ask to really get past all the layers and into the core of who somebody is? Hot take, magic interview questions are a myth. You have to focus on what it is that you need to know. And then the key is you got to ask behavioral questions to uncover the evidence. You got to figure out, hey, what have you actually done in your life that leads me to believe you can do this again? I like it. What is a quote or a mantra that just like is something that you kind of really hold as true? This too shall pass. I agree with that one so much, by the way. I grew up in a household that said it a lot, so I love it. What is one thing you wish you knew before you started Greenhouse? Oh, Uh, they say there's two kinds of economists, right? Those who know they can't predict interest rates and those who don't know they can't predict interest rates. I wish I could predict interest rates. (laughs) Amen. I think for everybody listening, amen. If you had to think of your biggest pinch me moment to date as an entrepreneur, so the day, Daniel, that you kind of came home and go, wow, we accomplished that. Yeah. What was it? What's that high in your head? Probably one of the earliest was you know, I'll never forget the first time I saw someone using greenhouse on an airplane. For some reason, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, get up from my seat, I go back to the back of the plane. As I'm walking back up the aisle, I'm looking over at people's shoulder, and I see someone with their laptop open at 30,000 feet using greenhouse. That moment to me was indelibly just, there's someone using my tool in this setting, just said something about what we had done in the world that will always stick with me. Uh, it was amazing. It is really amazing seeing something you created living in the wild without you putting it there. What's one category of innovation that you're most excited about? Yeah, we talked about AI before. I think solving that AI arms race and hiring. I think there's for hundreds of millions of job seekers, the job seeking process is bad and getting worse. You know, it stinks. And finding a way out of that where you really feel like you got a fair shot at getting a job and the process makes sense, like that's a big one that I'm really excited about. And finally, last question, what's one piece of advice you would give this next generation that you really want them to hear? Understand why you're doing things and do things for the right reason. Really good piece of advice, Daniel. (laughs) We can literally just drop the mic right there. First of all, Daniel, you're delightful. I am so grateful for what you built as literally a person on the other end of watching you build Greenhouse as a former founder and CEO. Thank you. Everybody out there, if you want to learn more, please check out greenhouse.com. That's greenhouse.com. And you can join us for next week for a new episode of For Starters with Alex Von Tobel. Daniel, we're rooting for you. Thank you so much for what you're doing, for hiring, for everybody everywhere. And I love that you're just maybe in inning four. You've got a big chapter ahead of you. Agreed. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.